from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay. Welcome to the National Book Festival. My name is Sydney Trent, and I'm the social issues editor at the Washington Post. The Post is a proud sponsor of this festival, which has been part of Washington life for 15 years, thanks to its host, the Library of Congress. I'm pleased to introduce to you today Kwame Alexander, author of The Crossover, winner of the John Newberry Medal and the Coretta Scott King Award in 2015. It's got a lot of fans, it's fantastic. Interviewed after receiving news of the Newberry, Kwame told the Washington Post that he, quote, tried to keep in mind what it's like to be a middle school student dealing with all the woes and wonders of the tween and teen years, love, loss, friendship, family, school, homework. But basketball was the key, he said. Quote, if you couch this story of, the friendshi of friendship and love and family in LeBron James and Kevin Durant, you've got your hook. And then, of course, you tell the story in this gorgeous, exuberant verse, and you have the crossover. Um, for all you parents who are struggling to get your kids to read more than Snapchat and Twitter, um, you should know that uh, Kwame said his parents forced him to uh, read every day uh, before he could do anything else. So, and look, look where it took him. Today, Kwame is a New York Times best-selling author of 21 books. His other works include Acoustic Rooster and His Barnyard Band, and the young adult novel, He Said, She Said. He's the founder of Book in a Day, a student-run publishing program that has created more than 3,000 student authors in 75 schools, and Leap for Ghana, an international literary project that builds libraries, trains teachers, and empowers children through literature. He visits schools and libraries, has owned several publishing companies, written for stage and television, produced jazz and book festivals, and taught in a high school is quite a formidable resume. Ladies and gentlemen, Kwame Alexander. When I say cross, you say over. Cross, over. cross, when I say say, you say yes. Say, yes. say. Yes. When I say Kwame, you say yeah, Kwame. Yeah. Kwame. Yeah. Cross. Over. Say. Yes. Y'all are ready. I love it. <laughs> wow. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, I really want to thank the National Book Festival for uh, including me in this 15-year this anniversary of this amazing um, and, and so necessary um, celebration of literature and language. I started writing poetry when I was 12 years old. Poetry saved my life. Poetry gave me life. My first poem was a poem I wrote for my mother on Mother's Day. It was a horrible poem. <laughs> Trust me, it began like this. Dear Mommy, I hate Mother's Day. <laughs> Who does that? The crossover. It's, it's, it's sometimes when I look at this book cover and see this medal, it just, I, I don't have any words. It just, wow. Um, I, I, I began my writing career here in, in, in Arlington, Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. area. And when I set out to become a poet, um, I wanted to be a full-time poet. I wanted that to be my job. I remember my father um, saying to me, you need to figure out a different route to make a living because poetry isn't going to necessarily um, be that career. And I told him, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to start my own publishing company and publish poets. And he sort of laughed in one breath. And then in the next, he gave me a check for $1,700. 
in, as an investment in my publishing company, which I always found interesting that he was telling me it's not going to work, yet he was investing in my future. Um, and so part of the reason why I'm here today is because of the immersion that my, my parents made sure took place in my home that was lined with books, that was the floors were stacked with books. And part of the reason I'm here today is because they forced me to read uh, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which had this shiny sticker on it, this gold medal, and I didn't know exactly what that meant and looked at it and said, most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. And I said, well, I'll go ahead and read it and read it and, and, and loved it, but didn't want to tell him because he had forced me to read it. How did we get here to the crossover? Um, I had written the crossover in the year 2008, and it was about 50 pages. And I had written 19 books prior to that and felt like this 50 pages was the best 50 pages I had ever written. It was a novel told through poetry. It was about um, a boy and, and who played basketball and who was taught by his father and, and who loved basketball. And I, I, I felt really good and sent this book off to an editor at a publishing company. And the editor sent me a wonderful email back saying, Dear Kwame, thank you so much for submitting your manuscript to us. Unfortunately, we aren't gonna publish it because it's not that good. And so I went back to Panera Bread to write draft two. I write in Panera Bread because my seven-year-old's daughter, um, she loves to play dress up and Monopoly. And so if I'm at home, I'm inevitably gonna have to be in a dress and a tiara. And so I go to Panera Bread to write. And so I went back and rewrote it and now the, brother ha the, the boy had a brother and, 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 and he, had a, he had a mother now and the mother was a principal in the school and, and the book was now 100 pages and I sent the book back to the editor and the editor says, she sends me an email and she says, Dear Kwame, thank you so much for submitting this manuscript to us. Unfortunately, it's still not that good and we aren't gonna publish it. And I felt like this was the best thing I had ever written. I'd written 19 books. I knew poetry. I had been trained by Nikki Giovanni for three years at Virginia Tech. I knew poetry. I knew how to make words dance on the page. And so I resubmitted the book two more times. I'd rewritten it. I had given the father an illness. I'd created a championship. I made the brothers twins, you know? <laughs> And I'd submit it to her two more times, and I got two more wonderful emails saying, Dear Kwame, thank you for submitting your book to us. Unfortunately, we aren't going to publish it because it's still not that good. And so that's four rejections. And so I said, well, maybe I've got to do something else. And I rewrote the book again, and this time it's about 230 pages, and it was the best poetry I felt like I'd ever written. Josh Bell is my name, but Filthy McNasty is my claim to fame. Folks call me that because my game's acclaimed so downright dirty it'll put you to. My hair is long, my height's tall. See, I'm the next Kevin Durant, LeBron, and Chris. Remember the greats? My dad likes to gloat. I ball with magic and the goat. But tricks are for kids, I reply. Don't need your pets. My game's so fly. Mom says your dad's old school like an old Chevette. You're fresh and new like a red Corvette. Your game's so sweet, it's Crepe Suzette. Each time you play, it's all... If anyone else called me fresh and sweet, I'd burn mad as a flame. But I know she's only talking about my game. See, when I play ball, I'm on fire. When I shoot, I inspire. The hoop's for sale, and I'm the... I felt like this was the best book I'd ever written. I made the words jump off the page. It was 19 books. I knew, I knew what I was doing. I had grown up in a house where I was immersed in language and literature. If there was anything I knew, it was how to make words explore and explode on the page. So I decided, okay, I'm going to send this out to 14 different editors. Somebody's going to like this book. So I send the book out, it's 230 pages. I'm feeling good. I get 14 wonderful emails and the emails say, Dear Kwame, thank you so much for submitting your book to us. Unfortunately, it wasn't funny then y'all. Unfortunately, none of us are gonna publish this book because boys don't like poetry, girls don't like basketball, basketball and poetry don't go together and this book isn't going to sell. So how many rejections is that? 18. When you get 18 people telling you no, telling you you're not worthy, the inclination is to walk out the door because you don't feel like you belong in the room because 18 rejections came your way. It's hard enough to receive one no, but to receive 18, 
what can you do with that? And so I was ready to walk outside the door. I was done. I, it was over. I, I was ready to give up. And then I realized something. I am a say yes person. I am the kind of person who does not let the no's define my yes. But in that moment, how am I going to make this yes come when 18 publishers are telling me no? How would you do it? I know it's tough, isn't it? I know. I decided to say yes to myself. I decided to embrace the no's. I decided to say, okay, in our lives, people are gonna tell us no. The no's are going to come. People are gonna have their expectations. Sometimes they're going to try to lower our goals based on the limitations of their expectations in life. The no's don't have to define you. So in that moment, I decided I'm gonna publish this book myself. It's going to come out. And a week later, what happened? I got an email. <laughs> and the email said, Dear Kwame, thank you so much for submitting your book to our company. I loved your book. Everybody on my staff has read your book. And Houghton Mifflin would like to publish your book. <laughs> I believe that in this life, we have to be prepared for the no's. We have to allow them to come. That's just a part of how the world works. Because here's what happens. When the no's come, there are so many no's in the universe. And so eventually, the no's are going to clear themselves away for what? The yes. And all it takes is one yes. That's all it takes. So then a funny thing happened the book got published. And on February the 2nd, I received a call. And the call said, Dear Kwame. Or the call, Dear Kwame, I'm still, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes as writers, we get caught in our own stories and we're off into a whole other thing. The, call, the, call, the caller said, is this Kwame Alexander? And I said, yes. And he said, Kwame, we're calling from the 2015 John Newbery Medal Committee. And of course, that can only be a good call, right? But in my mind, I'm thinking, well, when I reread the crossover, I found a typo. <laughs> this book sucks. <laughs> There's no way he's calling to tell me, like, the best news of all. So I probably, he's, the call is probably a second or third or fourth place, some sort of honorable mention. Okay, but I can deal with that because I came from a place of 18 rejections. And just to get the call is really just affirming. Now, the award would be great. The real reward is when the young people say to you, like the boy in Minneapolis who told me, Kwame, yo, I don't even like books, <laughs> but I couldn't put yours down. That's the reward. Kwame, we're calling from the Newbury Medal Committee to tell you that your book, The Crossover, and when he says that, has won. And when he says that, what goes through my mind are the 18 no's. What goes through my mind are my father forcing me to read his books. What goes through my mind are reading Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. We're calling to tell you that your book, The Crossover, is the recipient of the Newbery Medal. And that, I didn't hear anything else. Because after that, in my right ear, my wife is screaming, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. We have a time limit here, and they're very strict on the time limit. And I could talk all day with these stories, so I'd love to open it up with questions now. Yes. Yeah, I guess go to the mic. Yeah. Um, I teach middle school English. And I was wondering if you had any, if you had one piece of advice for our young people, what would it be? If I had one piece of advice for your young people, I can give you like three pieces. <laughs> That's fine too. One, uh, read the crossover. <laughs> we actually read it last year in eighth grade and we had some students, I think, come visit you uh, in Fairfax, we were in Fairfax County. You're already a step ahead. <laughs> Two, say yes, is how important it is to say yes, and three, I mean, I don't know. I probably have never said this to anyone. Have them read the crossover. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, Kwame. My name is Jesse, and I just wanted to thank you for your talk. I wonder if you can tell us the story of your first book getting published. That's kind of where I am right now. I'm an aspiring writer. Have written a, a children's novel, um, and I'm absolutely terrified of all those no's. But I'm I'm willing to do it, and um, I want to hear the no first. I just it's hard when you're just starting out and you have nothing to say. I have these 19 books, you know. So this is why you should listen to me. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that first one. Thanks. <laughs> the first one was just like the 19th. It was a bunch of no's. I nobody would publish it, and I decided I was going to publish it myself. And of course, I never got another call saying, "Well, we'll publish it." And so I published the first book myself, and it was a book of love poems. And and I had a thousand books that my father had given me the money to print, and I had to, had to figure out a way to sell them. And so I put myself on a 30 city book tour because I read an article about Stephen King going on a 20 city book tour. Of course, I didn't have any money, but I decided to do it. And I put myself in front of people like yourselves and, and went on a tour to churches and libraries and, and schools and ended up at a church in Los Angeles and, and had to figure out how I was gonna get home. Um, and so I knew I needed to sell some books. The pastor called me up on stage on, in the pulpit to, to recite a poem in front of these beautiful black women in church hats. And I've got to now do a love poem. Huh. But I also need to get home, so I got to, you know, sell some books. And so in front of everyone, I just, you know, recite, I have never been a slave, yet I know I am whipped. <laughs> like, who does that? <laughs> this is where it started. I have never been to Canada, yet I want to cross your border. <laughs> I have never traveled underground, yet the night knows my journey. If I were a poet in love, I'd say that with you. I have found that new place where romance is just a beginning and freedom is our end. And I sold 160 books. <laughs> I think you just, the answer is you just got to do it. You just got to put yourself out there and just accept the no's and say yes to yourself. Um, I'm Carolyn Johnson, and I'm supposing that those 18 rejections are like pushing water uphill with a rake. Oh, you read the book. Yeah. Look at you. <laughs> My question is, um, if your book became a movie, who would the characters be? Chuck Bell, Josh, JB, Crystal, and Miss Sweet Tea? So um, I was in Los Angeles about a month ago, a month and a half ago, and I was meeting with the producers of the movie. And uh, we were discussing who would play the children, and all of the children would be uh, unknowns. And, there would, and the actors would be twins. We would have two boys. Um, but for the father, you ready for this? Yes. This is, I know, my wife's like, don't say it because you might jinx it. All right, I, I, I won't say who we want, Will Smith. Next. <laughs> What about Crystal? What about what Crystal? About the wife. I don't, I don't know. Reg Regina Bell. <laughs> you asking and answering the questions. <laughs> this is kind of more of a comment. My name's Leanne Spaulding. I teach at UCF in Florida. And I too, uh, I'm a teacher educator and was a public educator. And I have two boys at home. And it's very difficult to get them to read. And on page 72, it's titled, Having a Mother. And it says, having a mother is good when she rescues you from the free throw attempt number 36. Your arms are heavy as sea anchors. But it can be bad when your mother is a principal at your school. Bad in so many ways. It's always education this and education that. And my 14-year-old son, when he read that, he screamed across the house, this is my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peyton Ferguson, and I wanted to ask you, Mr. Alexander, what inspired you to write this book? I wanted to write a book that I would have loved to have read when I was 12. I wanted to write a book that I felt like boys wouldn't uh, put down. I wanted to write a book that I felt like girls would, would, would want to read. I wanted to write a book that would... Um, show the world that um, boys who look like me laugh, breathe, dribble, love, cry, hurt, just like everybody else. I wanted to write a book that um, boys and girls from Aurora, Illinois, to Los Angeles, California, to um, Hop Hog, New York, to Singapore, would be able to envision themselves. I wanted to write a book that would be interesting to me as an adult. 
I tried to do all that stuff. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Hello. I am Elise Jackson, teacher uh, in Arlington, actually, Washington Lee High School. Very good. Um, my question for you is now that you have reached this, what is your next project? What do you think is going to be your next dream that you're going to aspire to achieve? Um, not that you haven't achieved so much already, but what do you think you have next in your future as far as writing? You know, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, I believe that writing is more than pen to paper. I believe that you have to live an authentic and a real life in order to have something authentic and real to write about. I try to, I try to live, I, my writerly life in, is, is about more than writing. And so I've been involved in some um, pretty dynamic projects with, with groups of writers. Like uh, we, do, we, have, we do some work in Ghana. It's called Leap for Ghana. Um, literacy empowerment, building a library, training teachers, providing scholarships to young girls to go to uh, high school because high school costs $1,000 a year and upwards. Um, in Ghana, and so um, the illiteracy rate is 60%. Those experiences, being able to travel abroad and interact with young people, it really shows me that your backyard is really global, you know? Um, I just really want to be able to spread the love, the gospel, the, po the power of poetry to young people. I believe that poetry is a bridge. I believe that there's no such thing as a reluctant reader. I believe that when you think about boys and they don't want to read, I believe they don't want to read books that aren't interesting to them. I believe that books are amusement parks. I believe that we need to give children the opportunity to choose to ride sometime. Um, I want to be able to showcase poetry and how it is a ladder and how when we climb a ladder, we start at, you know, sort of at the bottom and we have to climb our way up. And I don't want to say, because I don't want the poets to get upset with me. I'm not saying poetry is at the bottom, but I'm saying it's the basic building block. We expose children to accessible poetry and allow them to sort of climb that ladder and it will, it will allow them to appreciate language and literature in a very profound and life transforming way. Um, and so I really just want to be about, um, whether it's through my writing, whether it's through presenting, whether it's through interacting with young people, I want to be about the proliferation of of poetry. Thank you for the question. Okay, so since you're saying so much about poetry, there's a slam thing going on tonight. Are you coming to it? <laughs> and it's by teenagers. The teenagers, teenagers are like 16, like 15 and 17, maybe 18. I love it. So they're young and in high school. I guess I'm, I'm a say yes person, so yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. Hi Kwame, my name is Barb. I teach seventh grade language arts in Prince William County. So I see the kids that you want to have in front of your books. Um, 12th grade boy, or 12-year-old 12, 12 boys and girls. I, I loved your book. It was one of my favorites of the summer. That and Brown Girl Dreaming. Both of those books made, made me feel, as an educator, as a writer, that I could write. And I thought, I want, I have so many plans for your book in my classroom. And um, I, I would like you to address those writers who, um, after their first draft, have nowhere to go in the editing and revision process. I always tell my students, the first thing you write is not the best thing you write. It gets better as we go along, but I want to be able to encourage them. And I, I wondered, as a, your 12-year-old self, what would you like to hear from your teachers or the grown-ups around you who love you? Uh, what are those words of encouragement that I need to share with my students? I would have liked to have had teachers who danced naked on the floor. <laughs> Come on, people. Come on. I would have liked to have teachers who took the risk, who shared their story, who were unafraid to put themselves out there, because then that would have allowed me to want to do the same thing. I, wanted, I, want to, I would have wanted to have teachers that dance naked on the floor. I believe that that's what we have to do as teachers, as librarians, as parents. We got to put ourselves out there. We got to share our business with our kids. We got to allow them, we got to allow them to want to take risks, but they've got to see us do it. That's what I believe. I don't know if that answered the question, but I really wanted to say that because I believe that. Hi, I'm Karina, and I was just wondering what your top five favorite books are. Say again? Your top five favorite books. My top five favorite books. 
R. Wow. Well, let's take this opportunity to recognize some people who are in the audience. All right, so there is Meg Medina, who wrote an amazing book called Yaki Delgado Wants to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Tia Issa Wants a Car. She's a picture book writer. She is a uh, young adult novelist. Um, my assistant is also a writer. She's a poet. Her name is uh, Danielle Kuhn. She has a wonderful book of poetry called Gravity. Um, I saw Mary Quattlebaum over here, uh, children's picture books. And there's some other folks in here. Um, it, my, my favorites change. They change. I mean, wow. I don't know. Percival Everett, one of my favorite novelists. Alice Walker, Nikki Giovanni, Langston Hughes, E.E. E. Cummings. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's a wonderful question. I'm sorry I'm, I'm not more articulate and more te intelligent with that answer, but it, just, it, it vacillates. Hi, Kwame. I'm Kirsten. I'm a mom engineer, so I did not grow up reading every day, but that's one thing I'm trying to instill in my kids. So they've been reading every day. And we had a friend visiting this summer who the kids were like, Mom, you're not going to make him read every day, are you? What is he going to do when we're reading? I'm like, he's going to read. And they're like, what is he going to read? I'm like, the crossover. They're like, yes! And he went home, and his mom just sent me an amazing email. She's like, you just broke my heart that he was reading on vacation with you. And I just want to thank you for giving me that tool, because it's so hard sometimes. Our kids are all athletes, and they want to be outside, and they want to be playing ball. And um, that's where they are right now. They've got a tournament, so they're missing it. But I did want to hear about your Book in a Day program. I love that you're giving back, that you have a gift that you're sharing and, and with your Ghana program as well. So if you could just a little bit more on the Book in a Day. Book in a Day is a program. Thank you for that. Um, Book in a Day is a program I started in 2006 that teaches young people how to write and publish books. Um, we've done the program in 76 schools. And uh, we are in the process of rolling out the program so that more schools can um, afford it and can have access to it um, with Scholastic. Excellent. So, but the, the goal is if children take ownership in the publishing process, if they learn how to write well-crafted um, poetry and prose, and then are responsible for publishing that book, so they learn how to design a cover, they learn how to order a barcode, they learn how to proofread text. If they do all these things, they will um, be inducted, as Lucy Calkins likes to say, into the writerly life in a very profound and life-transforming way. And so that's what Book in a Day is. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. Uh, my name is Gigi Kay, and I find myself teaching, um, being a librarian in a high school, where I have been teaching kindergarten for the last 15 years. Um, and it, I find that um, in this particular school that there are 12th graders. Several have come to me and said that they don't even know how to check out a book because they've never been encouraged to check out a book. Um, from the library and um, the library is outdated um, but um, I don't feel like that the other educators in the building see how important it is for them to come and check out books um, they only give them books in the classroom um, could you uh, being a former high school teacher what could what can I say to them to encourage them uh, or to get them on board with me trying to get them to be more well read say to the young people uh, to the teachers. To the teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, so I lasted as a high school teacher for six months. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I'm the authority on that. It's, it's, uh, that's a really, uh, that's a good question. I need to give that some thought. Okay. Let's talk after. Okay. Last question. Hi, Kwame. Uh, Becky York is a friend of mine and said to say hello. Oh, uh, Becky. Um, I um, have, have picked up your book and I uh, work with kids who are athletes and I'm trying to encourage them to write. I would love to be able to write a book that they would read. And I read your poetry, and I'm convinced that you're an eighth grade boy. I'd agree with that. <laughs> but I'm looking, and you're not. So um, I'm very handsome, right? <laughs> you, there is that. There's aging that happens to all of us. The question is, how do you keep that voice that appeals to kids when you're writing it as an adult? Well, you have beautiful children, you know, and you have, you have, you have beautiful children who, who wake up at 1.45 a.m. last night and haven't been to sleep since, <laughs> um, and they inspire you. You have, um, I think, probably 40 or 50% of my, my life is, is in schools, 
and interacting with young people. So I'm not just sort of teaching, talking to them. I try to be a part of them. I try to be um, sort of immersed in their lives, you know, and, and that's exciting for me. I am constantly, I think T.S. Eliot said, immature writers imitate, mature writers steal. <laughs> I'm constantly borrowing from, from them and remembering what it was like for me um, to, be, to, be, to be in, in high school, to be in middle school. And I, I just, I, I mean, I've, I'm obviously, you know, grown now, but I still feel like I'm, you know, I've got that child in me. And, uh, and I just try to tap into that. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. I'll end with this uh, poem that um, I went in. My, my first school visit was in Arlington, Virginia. And it was, a, yeah, it was in 1992. And I was paid $25 an hour. Um, and it was one hour. <laughs> but it was a lot of money to me. And I remember going into the school, it was an alternative school, and I didn't necessarily know what that meant. And when I got there, I found out what it meant. It was uh, security and metal detector and dogs sniffing and, and, and kids who weren't, who were fighting and, and teachers who didn't care. And it was just, it was really an interesting space. And I was going in to read poetry um, and, and no one cared. And I remember, in that moment, that's sort of when I realized that poetry is sort of the great equalizer. It can be the thing um, for all of our children. If we can remember what it was like, because um, we were all taught poetry in, in elementary school. We all had the Dr. Seuss and the Shel Silverstein. And something happened in middle school, and, and something happened, and, and it became incomprehensible and stayed and, and un uninteresting, and we began to fear it. And my goal, you know, is to sort of bring back that love of poetry that many of us have forgotten. And so I told these kids, I just yelled a poem, much like I did in that church. And it was a haiku and a tanka. Um, high school students, so it was a love poem. It is not that I don't love you, she says. Indeed, I do. I want to kiss you, to lasso your lips, tame them, ride them, rein them into my stable, but first, my love, you must agree to commit to a breath mint. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.